On October 31st, 1972, two soldiers from SIL Team 1 did a brave job gathering secret information and rescuing prisoners from an enemy base by a river in Vietnam. Before we dive into the bravery of October 31st, 1972, let's rewind six months to get a better understanding of what led up to the mission on that day. It was on Easter Sunday, April 2nd, 1972, when Lieutenant Colonel ICL Gene Hamilton, ejected from a crippled EB-66 aircraft, hit by an enemy SAM. He was the sole survivor among his five crewmates. Descending into enemy territory, he faced 30,000 North Vietnamese soldiers, part of a massive offensive pushing south. The area, once held by American and South Vietnamese forces, now lay under enemy control, marked by the Kua Viet River. Hamilton's parachute opened amidst heavy cloud cover, obscuring the ground below. Despite immediate search and rescue efforts, two army helicopters dispatched to retrieve him were shot down. Another crew managed a controlled crash landing before being rescued. As night descended over northern South Vietnam, Hamilton found himself alone, surrounded by the advancing enemy. The Easter Offensive of 1972 had unleashed one of the largest enemy offensives of the Vietnam War. By morning on April 3rd, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton's position, marked by onboard Loran, was known to the Air Force, but unreachable due to the surrounding enemy force. Throughout the night, fellow pilots dropped mines around him to deter the North Vietnamese. With dawn breaking and the clouds lifting, a new rescue attempt commenced. Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander Jay Crow, escorted by additional aircraft, descended towards Hamilton. Met with intense enemy fire, his helicopter, Jolly Green 65, was severely damaged, but managed to return to base. Following, Jolly Green 66 inches faced enemy tanks and heavy fire as Lieutenant Colonel Bill Harris navigated to Hamilton's location within 100 yards, engaging the enemy. Where's the enemy fire coming from? Asked one of the pilots flying support for the effort. They come from everywhere, Harris replied as bullets riddled his helicopter and shattered the cockpit. As support pilots witnessed the chaos, Harris struggled to evade enemy fire that riddled his helicopter. Eventually, he limped back to safety despite severe damage. Before nightfall, another aircraft was hit, resulting in Captain William Henderson and Lieutenant Mark Clark ejecting near Hamilton. A coordinated rescue ensued, with all three hiding from the enemy, preparing for extraction as more rescue aircraft approached. As enemy fire relentlessly pounded the rescue efforts, three helicopters were shattered, forcing retreat before nightfall. On the ground, Hamilton, Henderson, and Clark braced for the worst. Within 24 hours, three helicopters were lost, five severely damaged, and three rescuers perished, with a fourth captured, leaving the trio surrounded. On April 3rd, Henderson fell into enemy hands, intensifying the urgency of the mission. Hamilton, carrying vital intelligence, became a prime target. Despite enemy traps, American forces launched airstrikes, while Hamilton directed ground fire. The North Vietnamese used them as bait, targeting rescue forces, leading to devastating losses. Amidst intense airstrikes on April the 6th, Jolly Green 67 attempted a rescue. Amidst heavy fire, the helicopter was engulfed in flames, claiming six lives. On the ground, Hamilton mourned their sacrifice, vowing to survive for their sake. By April 7th, two more airmen were downed, adding to the toll. Despite heroic efforts, the situation grew dire, with too many damaged aircraft and casualties. In seven days, soldiers from all branches risked all to uphold the creed. We don't leave anyone behind. Despite not knowing the men personally, rescue crews risked their lives for their fellow Americans. Each was identified by unique call signs. Lieutenant Bruce Walker and Larry Potts were Covey 282 Alpha and Bravo, while Mark Clark was Nail 38 Bravo, and William Henderson, captured, was Nail 38 Alpha. Only Bat 21 Bravo, the navigator, survived the downed EB-66. Recognizing the need for a covert ground operation, a commando team led by Lieutenant Thomas Norris was assembled. On April 8th, they set out to rescue Clark and Hamilton. Norris, a Navy SEAL, defied odds and expectations with his small, determined team. As the mission unfolded, Clark was directed to the river, while Hamilton's position required a complex code. Norris's team navigated enemy territory, eventually finding Clark, but their search for Hamilton proved elusive. On April 13th, with Hamilton's condition worsening, 
Norris embarked on his riskiest mission yet. He and one team member, dressed as fishermen, navigated through enemy-infested waters to reach Hamilton. Their journey was fraught with danger, but they pressed on, driven by a sense of duty and determination. Amidst the chaos of war, Norris and his team embodied the spirit of never leaving a comrade behind. Norris and Kiet navigated through enemy territory to find Hamilton, who had endured nearly 12 days of harrowing survival. Exhausted and frail, he was helped into a hidden sampan as they embarked on their perilous journey to safety. As gunfire erupted, they raced downstream, seeking cover and air support. With Hamilton safely ashore, Norris administered aid while coordinating their evacuation. The saga of the rescue of Bat-21 Bravo was complete. Norris, nominated for the Medal of Honor, humbly declined, considering his actions part of his duty. Despite the popular Bat-21 movie, his role remained classified. His sole focus was to continue serving as a Navy SEAL. After the heroic rescue, Norris returned to plan the rescue of Lieutenant Bruce Walker, who tragically became MIA. Norris continued his service, training South Vietnamese frogmen, eventually fading into history. Meanwhile, the American presence in Vietnam diminished, with a few SEALs remaining for potential rescue missions. Among them, Mike Thornton, a seasoned veteran, embodied the essence of a hero, though he sought only to do his duty without fanfare. After six months on October the 31st, 1972, Navy SEAL Lieutenant Thomas R. Norris had gone into a big group of enemies near the Kua Viet and Kamlo rivers, just south of the DMZ, to rescue two pilots who had crashed, the enemy had taken control of the area. The Kua Viet River base, which used to be important for American and ARVN defense in the Northern Worst Corps, was now under enemy control, along with much of I Corps, as the North Vietnamese kept invading the South. They needed to know more about where the NVA were going, what they were planning, which places they were targeting, and how strong they were. Reports from aircraft flying over the heavily armed enemy territory weren't enough to give accurate information. So they decided that a small team, including a new LDNN officer, two experienced LDNN frogmen, an American SEAL Lieutenant and Michael Thornton would have to go among the enemy to gather the needed information. It was going to be a dangerous and intense mission happening on Halloween night. A tiny boat floated quietly on the waves near the coast of South Vietnam. Mike Thornton started paddling towards the shore while his lieutenant, the only other American with them, told him where to go. As the Vietnamese boat they had come from faded into the dark, three LDNNs, South Vietnamese SEALs, joined Thornton and his lieutenant in the small boat. They were slowly heading towards the beach. It was a little after four in the morning. Mike Thornton knew about Lieutenant Tom Norris's brave rescue mission, which had happened just a few miles away six months earlier. He understood that even though they were landing on the shores of South Vietnam, they wouldn't find any friendly faces there. The five men were all alone. If they got into trouble, there wouldn't be any air support or help, just gunfire from a naval ship far out at sea. After reaching shallow water, the men got out and pulled the raft to the beach, hiding it carefully. Then they started walking north towards the Kua Viet River and the old naval base controlled by the enemy now. There wasn't much cover. In the dark early morning, they moved quietly from one sand dune to another, making sure not to be seen by the many enemy camps they passed. Time passed slowly, but the SEALs couldn't find the river they were looking for. They couldn't even see any familiar landmarks. It was clear that they were lost. As the first light of morning appeared on the horizon, the SEAL lieutenant communicated silently with hand signals, instructing the team to head back to the beach. Through the radio, they learned roughly where they were. Originally, the plan was to land the team south of the Kua Viet River, so they could move northward directly towards the river and the old naval base. However, they had ended up too far north, landing above the river. Their journey had taken them off course, nearly into the demilitarized zone. With their hearts racing and daylight approaching, the team breathed a quiet sigh of relief when they finally spotted the beach where they had hidden their raft. They were almost back. What could have been a disastrous situation was starting to turn out all right. Suddenly, the quiet of the early morning was shattered by gunfire. The SEALs immediately dropped to the ground, firing back at the NVA soldiers who had spotted them. Two enemy soldiers had found them and started shooting, but soon the noise of battle attracted even more enemy soldiers, up to 50, who rushed towards them to attack. 
The team leader quickly organized his men into a small defensive position as the enemy came within 25 meters of them. During the exchange, one of the LDNNs was shot in the hip, and shrapnel from an enemy grenade wounded both of Mike Thornton's legs and caused wounds on his, on his back. The lieutenant called for support from the USS Newport News, a naval heavy cruiser, but it couldn't provide effective cover fire because the enemy was too close. The ship's powerful guns could harm both the SEAL team and the enemy at such a short distance. For 45 tense minutes, the battle continued, with five members of a naval team fighting for their lives against overwhelming odds of 10 to 1. They knew more enemy troops could show up at any moment. The team leader made a risky decision. He radioed the Newport News and asked for five minutes before they unleashed their heavy five-inch shells on their position. Meanwhile, he ordered Thornton and two LDNNs to quickly make a dash for the hidden raft while he and the other LDNN provided cover. As the three men sprinted across the beach towards the last sand dune and the raft, gunfire erupted again. The team leader and the LDNN returned fire, keeping the enemy at bay to protect their teammates. Then, suddenly, everything went dark for the SEAL lieutenant. His LDNN partner saw a large hole in the left side of the lieutenant's head, turned away, and ran to join the others. Go! Go! He yelled as he reached the last sand dune with his teammates. Where's my lieutenant? asked Thornton. Dead! shouted the LDNN. It was obvious the LDNN was convinced nothing more could be done as he urged immediate withdrawal. I'm not leaving without my lieutenant, Thornton quickly asserted. In the SEALs, leaving a teammate behind was unthinkable. Thornton dashed out from their hiding spot, racing across the sand dunes to where his team leader was last seen. There, he frantically searched for him. Two enemy soldiers spotted the lieutenant's body at the same time Thornton did. Without hesitation, Thornton shot them both and hurried to his fallen leader. The lieutenant had suffered a serious head injury, with his skull visible through a deep wound. He was unconscious, but still breathing. With his strength, Thornton hoisted his lieutenant onto his shoulder and sprinted back across the exposed sand dunes. Bullets flew around them as Thornton returned fire, but miraculously, neither he nor his wounded lieutenant were hit. When they reached the last dune, Thornton's LDNN teammates looked to him for guidance. The NVA were closing in, attempting to surround them. Thornton directed his comrades toward the waves breaking on the beach, 250 yards away. As artillery shells from Newport News exploded behind them and enemy gunfire carved trenches in the sand, the team moved forward. With sheer determination, Thornton carried his injured lieutenant the entire distance. Finally, he felt the refreshing touch of the ocean water on his fatigues. With determination, he plunged into the water, pulling his lieutenant along and swimming desperately towards safety. The NVA soldiers pursued them into the ocean, continuing to shoot until the men were out of range. Thornton then inflated his lieutenant's life vest, pulling him further into the ocean away from danger. For two hours, they floated on the waves, Thornton ensuring his injured teammate's head stayed above water. Eventually, they were spotted and rescued by the same boat that had dropped them off earlier that morning. It was nearly noon, the entire ordeal had unfolded in less than eight hours. Mike Thornton's bravery in refusing to abandon his wounded lieutenant and his courage in returning under enemy fire to rescue him earned him a recommendation for the Medal of Honor. His actions marked the final Medal of Honor action of the Vietnam War and the last by any living American. Less than a year later, on October 15, 1973, Navy Lieutenant Michael Edwin Thornton received a summons to the White House to accept his award. Meanwhile, the severely injured SEAL team leader was still in recovery at Bethesda Naval Hospital, unable to attend the ceremony due to the seriousness of his condition. Thornton later recalled, We had to sneak him out of Bethesda, but he made it. As the citation recounting Thornton's heroic deeds was read, then President Richard M. Nixon approached to bestow the Medal of Honor upon the Navy SEAL for his unwavering commitment to his fellow soldier. Watching proudly from the sidelines, the injured team leader felt a sense of gratitude. That team leader was Navy Lieutenant Thomas R. Norris. Tommy Norris continued his recovery for another year. On March 4, 1976, President Gerald R. Ford welcomed two former prisoners of war to the White House to honor their bravery with Medals of Honor. Alongside Vice Admiral James Bond Stockdale and Air Force Colonel George E., a posthumous award was given to the family of Air Force Captain Lance Peter Sajan who had lost his life in a North Vietnamese prison camp. After this, the president addressed the courageous SEAL. 
Despite the lieutenant's objections, his nomination for the Medal of Honor, stemming from his rescue of Lieutenant Mark Clark and Lieutenant Colonel Ideal Hamilton, had been approved. On this occasion, a Navy SEAL stood to the side, observing the ceremony with a smile on his face and pride in his heart. Mike Thornton wouldn't have missed this moment for anything. So this is it, my folks. I hope you enjoyed watching today's video. Let us know what your thoughts are about this heroic story in the comments. If you love war stories like these, make sure to subscribe to our channel and leave this video a like if you enjoyed it. Till then, take care of yourself. See you in our next video.